And um, we just pray um, that we'll hear your word tonight, that we'll understand your word, that we'll be blessed by your word, and that you'll just speak to us tonight, Father. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So you say this means that I have to speak twice as much now. <laughs> because half of it's taken up with translation. So um, uh, that means I, I have to I have to stretch my material now. It's OK. I'm sure I'll be OK. But if we get any time left at the end, we'll, we'll just have a discussion. I'm going to just change my screen. So uh, to speaker now. So if we get any questions at the end, I'm sorry for those who maybe will miss some of what I'm saying because we don't have translation. But um, basically, I want to look at Romans 6, 7 and 8. Um, now, I, I call these the sort of reset chapters, because for me, there are chapters that when I read them, they really kind of give me a reset. They kind of put everything back into focus. Um, there are amazing chapters in, in the book of Romans. R Romans chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8 are an incredible um, chapters. And, you know, I recommend you read them. I mean, read the whole book of Romans, but, you know, at least read them once every few months, 6, 7, and 8 because they're such important chapters. Um, and what I wanted to talk about tonight was legalism and license. You know, there, there are two, there's the path of life. And on each side of the path of life, there's a ditch. And one of those ditches is license. And one of them is legalism. And we can fall into either of those two paths. And the interesting thing is that the root, I believe, of both of those paths is the same. The reason that people choose license or legalism is the same. It's the same root of the problem. License is where we, um, we believe that, you know, we can just continue in sin because of God's grace. In fact, that's how Romans 6 begins. It says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul says, God forbid. So that's when people understand God's mercy and grace, but want to continue to live a lifestyle of sin. And the root of both license and legalism is the desire to remain in control and not to surrender to God. You see, when people want to remain in license, it's because they want to be able to enjoy the benefits of God, but still continue in sin. So it's, it's like wanting the, wanting the benefits without the commitment. And we see this in Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. Now, what is our response to be? I'm reading from J.B. Phillips. I thought I'd surprise you with a different translation. This is J.B. Phillips. So this might make it a bit fresher for you, a bit different for you. If you're familiar with one version, sometimes it's good to look at another version just to give you a, a different angle on it. Now, what is our response to be? Shall we sin to our heart's content and see how far we can exploit the grace of God? What a terrible thought. So Paul's saying, you know, because God is gracious and he's forgiven us and we're saved by grace and not by works, should we just continue in sin? He says, God forbid. And then he begins to explain how Jesus has removed our sin through his death. Not only has he removed our sin, but we died with him. We, we participate in his death on the cross. And through his death on the cross, 
we both die and we're raised to newness of life. And he's saying that we shouldn't continue in sin because, you know, just because God has been gracious to us, we, we you know, and of course, you know, this is avoiding the relationship that we could have with God because sin is what cuts us off from God. And so if we continue in sin, we don't enjoy the fullness of the relationship that we should have. So Paul says in, in there, we, God forbid that we should continue in sin. So that's license. And, you know, often we've seen, you know, moves in the church where, you know, it's gone one way and then it goes the other way. Of course, the opposite way to license is legalism. Now, legalism is also an avoidance of relationship. It's an avoidance of God. And it's substituting rules and laws and, um, you know, regulations uh, and ritual for relationship. And it's presenting to God a performance rather than presenting to God our hearts. It's when we present to God our religious performance. God is not after our performance. He's after our hearts. But, you know, re what religion wants to do is present to God a, 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 a something to appease God, but not actually to give ourselves to God, not to give our complete self to God. It's, it's a giving of a performance. Jesus said of the Pharisees, he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So it's honoring God with our lips and even our actions, but not giving God our heart. So we see these two things in operation and Paul deals with both of these things and he shows how Jesus removes both of these barriers, both of these ways uh, through the cross. And he shows this in Romans chapter six and Romans chapter seven. In chapter six, we read about how he's dealt with the old man, the sinful nature. He says our old man was crucified with Christ on the cross. Our sinful nature was taken to the cross. So we are free. We don't have to continue living in sin. And then in Romans chapter seven, he talks about the law and he says he's I'm addressing those who know the law. And he talks about it as a marriage. And he says, you were married to the law. You were betrothed to the law. But when one of the partners dies, you're no longer bound to the law. And he shows how we've been delivered from the law's requirements so that we no longer have to be bound to legalism. And he also shows, he continues to show in chapter seven, how legalism actually can't set you free. It doesn't set you free. Trying to just obey God through your own willpower, through your own strength, does not lead to freedom. And all the law can do and his purpose is to show us our sin and our need of the relationship and the power of the Holy Spirit. So we see those two separate operating um, ways of operating being addressed in Romans 6 and Romans 7 and being dealt with by Christ. He's removed the obstacle of sin through his death, through taking us to the cross. He's removed the obstacle of the law because he, he gives this illustration of we were married to the law. Let me just read a bit of seven. You know very well, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who were well acquainted with the subject, that the law can only exercise authority over a man as long as he is alive. A married woman, for example, is bound by law to a husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, then his legal claim over her disappears. This means that if she should give herself to another man while her husband is alive, she incurs the stigma of adultery. But if after her husband's death, she does exactly the same thing, no one call her an adulteress. The legal hold over her has been dissolved by her husband's death. So, my brothers, the death of Christ on the cross has made you dead to the claims of the law. 
and you are free to give yourself in marriage, so to speak, to another. So he's saying it's as if through our association with the death of Christ, we've died to that legal law, you know, and we're now set free to follow Christ. And the, 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 the law that stood against us has been taken out of the way. And he then describes the struggle that people have who try to live under the law, you know. Now, Romans 7, there are different views on the way you interpret 7, but that's that's the way I see it. So if you disagree, we can talk about that later. And at the end, he says, so what's the solution to all of this? So all of this is leading up to Romans chapter 8. So Jesus removes the obstacle where we just continue in sin by taking us to the cross with him and saying that we don't need to continue in sin. And then in Romans 7, he takes away the obstacle of having to fulfill the law by showing that we've died to the law through Christ and he's taken the law out of the way. And then in Romans chapter 8, he shows us the way of the spirit and the way of relationship. Now, we can look at this and say, well, that's all very well. But when we look at Christianity, we see that it's a struggle. And some people try to interpret Romans chapter seven as that struggle. But I see Romans seven as being it's not that it's, he's given an example of what it's like trying to live by the law. If you read it carefully, you'll see that. And why it's a struggle is not because. Um, is because we we want to avoid the we want to avoid the relationship we want to avoid the commitment we want to avoid so you know we want to avoid things it's it's because we want to avoid the full implications of following jesus that i believe it's a struggle because you know within us it means that we have to surrender our um supremacy we have to sur surrender our throne to christ we have to allow christ to become the center of our life uh, we no longer you know for the person who's under license he can no longer do those things that are wrong he has to obey christ he has to follow jesus for the person who's the legalist you know he he has to uh, let go of his own self-righteousness and his ability to save himself and surrender to the fact that he, he can't save himself and he has to surrender to Christ. So in Romans chapter 8, it talks about the fact that we now are under a different, we have a different option between those two options, legalism and license. And this is the path that Christ sets before us is the path of surrender to the spirit and to be led by the spirit Romans 8 said as many as led by the spirit they are the sons of God so Romans 8 is talking about this 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 way where we're led by the Holy Spirit but you see although Paul has dealt uh, Jesus has dealt but Paul has spoken about it although Jesus has dealt with the obstacle of the flesh and the old man and the law we still have a choice to make in this now some people say well it's all been done we don't have to do anything because they're concerned that you know your your teaching works well it has all been done but we still have to choose to walk in the spirit there's there's always the option to not do what we were called to do there's always the option to step out you know god is not interested in having mindless robots that just do what you know he's interested in having people who walk in relationship who walk in fellowship with him who he communes with who he imparts stuff to he's not he's not after making people automatically something he gives people choices and he wants people to choose him out of devotion, out of love, not because it's a compulsion or it's all been done, you know. 
And he makes this clear in various places in the scripture where he says, you know, that we're to put off the old man. Now, although the provision is already there in Romans chapter six, it's already been done, but we still have to make that choice to put off the old man. You know, we still have to, um, we can still step out of the spirit. You know, we have to learn to abide in the spirit. We have to learn to walk in the spirit. And Romans chapter eight is all about walking in the spirit. And this is where the effectiveness of being a Christian comes into play when we begin to walk in the spirit under the control of the Holy Spirit and allowing the spirit to operate in us. And then we become, as it says, sons of God. Then we become those who uh, no longer controlled by the flesh, no longer under the dominion of the law, but are free to obey Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we see that in Romans chapter 8. So it says in Romans chapter 8, it says, if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons. You see, the whole, the whole thing about what God was intending to bring about for humanity was the relationship. The relationship that was lost in Eden, God's progression through bringing in the law, through bringing in the old, through the Old Testament, the prophets, and then through Christ, was to bring us back into that position of relationship. You know, the key to life is relationship. And Jesus came to remove every obstacle from us having that relationship with him and with his father and with the spirit restored. So he removed the sin problem, not just the sins we had committed, but the, the old man, the sin nature. He said he took our old man, died on the cross with him. He also um, dealt with the law, the legal problem that the law stood condemning us you know, uh, and the law stood against us. So Jesus came to re remove every obstacle so that we could enter into relationship. And that's at the heart of the Christian message is the restoration, the reconciliation. He says, Paul says that we have a ministry of reconciliation to reconcile people back to God. And so if we're not growing back into that relationship, if we're either, you know, becoming just more legalistic or becoming more licentious, we are moving away from the position that God wants us to be in, which is relationship. Relationship is the heart of everything. But in order to have the benefits of that relationship, we have to avoid the pitfalls of taking God's grace for granted and continuing to live in sin or becoming religious, you know, and legalistic, you know. Sometimes it's we, we can easily spot the um, when we're sinning. But sometimes we don't so easily recognize when we're avoiding God by being religious. We're presenting to God some work, thinking that that's what he's after, rather than giving to God our heart and our whole life. You know, but we would rather give him, um, you know, we'd because we, we'd rather maintain control, whereas relationship with God involves us relinquishing and surrendering to him and that's where the challenge of being a christian comes in that's where god begins slowly to lead us into that more narrow way of deepening our relationship with us because he wants us to walk in fellowship with him 
one of the most challenging, I find one of the most challenging passages in the whole of the scriptures is about Enoch. Uh, and it's, Enoch is only mentioned in, I think, one, two verses, maybe in the, the whole Old Testament. I've got a comment here from somebody, I'll read from John. I'll read it in a minute. Enoch has only got a few verses mentioned in the whole Old Testament. And it says Enoch walked with God. You know, and I mean, what a testimony. <laughs> uh, what, a, what a challenge, you know, that, that Enoch presented um, to everybody. And it says he he walked with god and he was not um and um so he walked with god and he was not because somebody once said god said to enoch well you're closer to my place than yours you might as well come up <laughs> you know which is a nice thought and that's that's what god is leading us to is to that position of relationship. And in order to do that, and in order to do that, we have to put off the old man. We have to embrace what Jesus, the finished work of Christ on the cross. We have to apply it and walk in it. I'll give you a couple of scriptures. For instance, um, in Galatians, Galatians chapter, well, I've got it on a piece of paper somewhere. Galatians, yeah, Galatians chapter five, it says that this. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the spirit, let us also walk by the spirit. And then he says, let us not become boastful, challenging one another envying one another so there's obviously the potential there for us not to walk in the spirit because it wouldn't say let us not become boastful so we can see that it's not automatic we have to continue to abide we have to continue to walk in the spirit we also see in romans chapter 8 verse 12 to 13 so then brethren we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh for if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So it's saying we need to put to death the deeds of the body by the spirit. And I'm just going to check this message because I've got a feeling this is going to stir a few things up. So if that's the case, I am quite... I'm not quite sure what I, I, I'm actually I'm actually going to leave it at that and we're going to have a discussion because I think it'd be quite good for people to talk about what they want to share because um, and there's some comments up here which I don't I'm, I'm not sure um, what people are saying so I, I'm going to because I I this, I, I realize this subject brings up some, you know, um, differences of opinion. So I'm actually going to. The meeting is now open for anybody who wants to speak or uh, chip in. Please feel free. Oh, yeah, just what I said there, Richard, was agreeing with you. So it wasn't disagreeing, but just that was at, at the beginning what. I just felt how stupid it is to try and be you know, use license because God knows. You, th you think they think they're sort of hiding behind the bike sheds and having a smoke or something. You know what I mean? You can't do that with God. He he will know. You can't you can't possibly even think of fooling him. What what's the point of you know thinking, oh yeah, I can do what I like and at the same time I can have God. That's just not gonna work, is it? That's just what I was thinking how crazy. Oh, it is. Right, right. I didn't. Yeah. I, I, um, well, I, it's not going to work. But I think, if we're honest, we've probably all done that. I certainly have. So, no, there's a difference between there's a difference between warring with your own 
whatever problem and going down that path and then thinking, oops, I've done it again. Oh, heck, why do I keep doing this? And coming back, that's a different thing from like, like deliberately. I think because what you were describing there was sometimes people say, oh, yeah, I can have this and God at the same time. I don't think you, you can do that, can you? It's like God doesn't well, repentance. Yeah, that's what James talks about. He says, you know, you adulterers, don't you know that friendship with the world is eminently against God? So, But these are, you know, all the letters in the New Testament are addressed to believers. I mean, you have to realise that the letters of the Bible weren't written to non-believers, they were written to believers. So I, I think the other thing is we can, because my experience in the past has been that I can't get free of sin unless I surrender to God, because it's only God who can deal with, you know, when I've had problems with addictions, I haven't been able to get free of them. So I'm then faced with this choice. If I want to be free of my sin, I have to surrender to God. <laughs> and I think that's also partly what I meant. You know, if, if you, you know, whereas people who choose license, it's because they don't want to submit or surrender to God. And the only way they're going to get free of their sin is through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, some things I remember I used to smoke and I tried to stop smoking. And as much as I tried, it just didn't work because willpower was not sufficient. But the moment I took the issue to God and surrendered to God, I stopped. Um, and, and then I was set free. But of course, that means you've got to surrender to God. Whereas, you know, I think this is the issue here with the, with the two sides of the coin is that, you know, the middle path is the path of surrender. The middle path is the path where we submit to the Holy Spirit. Richard, would you explain to me what you mean by license like in this context? Like, Well, it's, it's continuing license. Um, is when we sin, you know, and we still we we still continue in sin, although we claim to be a Christian. So we may be doing things like sexual problems or drinking or getting drunk, but we're still claiming to be a Christian. But we, you know, and and we we we're we're using the grace of God as a hiding under the grace of God. Now God and is very gracious to sin. Yeah, God is, is very. That what it means? Yeah. like using the grace of God as a license to sin, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, or, or you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? See, God is very gracious, isn't he? He doesn't, he doesn't pull us up on 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 our faults. He's not, he's not like like that. But but you know, he's very patient with us. But you know, we could try to, um, you know, continue when. You know, if a child's naughty, you, 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 you know, but when, as you get older, you know, you don't expect that, that to continue. The thing about this that I, as I, I was actually speaking to someone about this recently who said, you know, well, if Jesus has forgiven your sin, and this was a non-believer, said, well, if Jesus has forgiven your sin, then, you know, you could just do whatever you want. There's no restrictions. And I was trying to explain to him that that's not how it works the best I could. But the thing that it made me understand for myself, even, you know, when I read Romans and so on, is that a person who is, I'm going to say, detached from God and who is religious, or not religious, but maybe, you know, just not connected to God, um, could sin, you know, but because there's not that, that connection to God, there's no relationship, I think they don't feel the conviction that the Holy Spirit fit, um, brings, and therefore will continue to sin and not even think anything of it. Whereas a person who is connected to God, who does have a relationship with God, when they sin, there is that conviction. And I think it goes to what Jill was saying is, you know, they might sin, but they know it's wrong and therefore will endeavor not to do it again, whether they do it rightly or wrongly. But I think it's that conviction inside of us that that tells us yes god is still working in me because I, I know right now what i'm doing is wrong i know i should be doing better i know i should be surrendering and may, and it's the flesh that stops us doing it and i guess that's what you're talking about that step further of surrendering but yeah that's my understanding of it you we're all we're all 
you know, still struggle with the fallen man. We all still struggle to function in the new creation. But it's that conviction inside of us that yeah. we need to follow. I mean, I'm trying not to look at this on a sort of negative way. I think the positive thing is that Jesus has, you know, removed the barriers. If we if we read those passages in Romans six and seven, he has he's done the work. You know, he's removed, you know, you know, he's removed the obstacles, but we have to walk in the goodness of that. You know, we have to embrace that. And um I think people, I think we can be a bit trickier than we think we are, <laughs> if that makes any sense. You know, sometimes that we, we, we can believe that we, you know, but there's other stuff that we, you know, we kind of want God sometimes on our terms, don't we? Um, we want God to, you know, we want things on our terms. And it's not really the way that God designed it to be. It's, it's you know, the surrender part, um, you know. Salvation comes, you know, that's, that's the gift that God gives us through the new birth. But the sanctification can be a process. You know, it's a process we work through. And um, I... You know, you, 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 I mean, if you, you, you read these passages and you see that Jesus has made the provision, you then have to ask yourself, well, why do we see the problems in the church? Why do we see so many difficulties in people's lives? Well, you know, we then have to think, well, what, what is causing people not to walk uh, in, in, in Christ? Yes, Jill. On mute. You're, on, you're still on mute, Jill. One of them is about choosing to sin, and the other one is about license. So I'll start with the license one. License means L I C S E N S E, license. Anyway, it's, it's at the root of the word licentiousness. So it, it means, it actually means bad behavior. It doesn't right. mean a license as in like, like a license to drive. It's, um, it's licentious behavior. It means, it means all the bad behavior. But um, yeah, to get back to choosing, as, as you were talking at the beginning, Richard, and I was thinking about like, like, you know, it's like tying in with what Krishani was saying about not going to sleep and about staying alert. And I think, you know, my, one of my problem is like, oh, I just want to think my own little thoughts and like, I don't know, be like reading the newspaper and really I know that probably on the way into work I should be praying getting ready for work and get ready for who I'm going to see and praying about it and all that kind of thing and I just like day after day I'll plan always to do the right thing and day after day I will go on a little daydream and read the paper and oh nearly at work. oh heck I better pray so um I think I think it's like choosing I know it's like hard to be disciplined but I think it's good actually to choose to be with God like I was on the way to it today and all the way on the train I was like um doing my thing basically but I got off the train I actually managed to kind of um what do you call it meditate on a word of Jesus the whole time on the way to work so I was actually walking I managed to meditate the whole way and I'm thinking you know like you're saying about choosing to be with him like choosing to walk with him and think thoughts for him and spend some time with him so that when I get to work I'm kind of um I don't know, ready for whatever in, in a better way than I would have been. So it's, it's that choice thing, isn't it? All, all the time, really, even in small things like the things I'm talking about. Yeah, that's it. There we go. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I, I think it is that it is the choice. Um, and although, um, you know, Romans 6 talks about the old man being crucified there still seems to be this need for us to be actually to put him off. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, which, you know, is, is, is strange in one way, but it's, it, it's a fact, isn't it? You know, we still need that discipline, you know, um, we still need to exercise the will 
the choice to choose to do the right thing. Because the, if we just allow our flesh, it will just become, you know, it will take control. Um, so we still need to make that choice. And, and, and God, obviously, you know, um, we all have the same, we're all given the same opportunities in a sense through, through the death of Christ, but we all choose how, what we do with the opportunities given us, um, you know, how, how we use the provision that is provided for us. Um, so we have to work, walk in the, in the goodness of that. Anybody else? Paul's very quiet. <laughs> this is unusual. There's quite a bit of household noise, or has been. All oh, right. Um, it's distant at the moment. Um, yeah, I'm challenged by the whole subject because I find that when I'm coasting along in, in, in terms of having what I think is a close relationship with the Lord, um, there is a danger of a kind of a legalism creeping in. Oh, I'm doing well. And right. it then becomes about performance. And um, there's always a danger that you look to perform well. And having just finished 44 years work and having had performance reviews on regular basis, it's what the world does. And I can tend to veer that way until I'm hauled up by the fact that there are still areas where... Uh, yeah, I mean, these last few weeks, I found it really, really hard, as Jill was saying, um, or I'm not saying she was saying it was hard, but there is this choice to make. And certainly with, with, the, with the family here, I've had choices to make as to whether I, <laughs> I get a quiet time, have a good one, um, um, get into the Word, or, or find a multitude of other things to do. So the, the doing is performance, but spiritually we also need to to grow and so it, it's yeah. you know test me and try me oh lord and show if there's any any way in me you know sometimes you you think you're okay because you're judging by number of brownie points you you've earned and it's it's that's a deceit that's legalism right. and it can be licensed i guess look what i've done yeah. it could be either of those can't it yeah uh, I, I think it, it's always amazes me that, you know, we sometimes we make that conscious decision to spend time with God and it usually turns out to be fantastic. But there are, there are the times when I, I don't feel like it, but I still do it and it turns out to be great. And I think, well, why, why did I not want, what was it in me that didn't want to spend time with God? It doesn't make any sense because the moment I sort of, tune in i think wow what what did i what did I do this half an hour earlier you know um and i think that's putting off the old man it's going against our our nature isn't it there's that we we go against ourselves to walk in the spirit there are times when we have to walk against ourselves we have to go against ourself um and put off that old man as it were you know because naturally you know other things are appealing until we get in the spirit and then we realize that's the real place we want to be. That's the place we, you know, that, that it's all really, you know, it's, it's happening at. So um, we, we have to do that. We have to be aware of that, you know, that, that ability for the, for the flesh to, to, you know, crowd out the spirit and I, I don't know whether one would define that as license, you know, the flesh crowding out the spirit, you know, you just might not feel like it, but then there are sins of omission as well, aren't there? So um, uh, I, I really can't get into the word tonight. I'm too tired and mm, giving yeah. in, you know, um, I guess it's, 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 it's approaching license, isn't it? Oh, God won't mind. 
But it's also been feeling orientated, isn't it? Sometimes, you know, because we're supposed to be led by the spirit. So the spirit is supposed to be preeminent. The emotions and are supposed to be under subjection to the spirit. And there, there are times when we have to pull up the spirit and say, okay, spirit, you will be over the, over the, over the emotions, over the feelings. I won't allow the feelings to control me. Because in the world, that's how the world operates, isn't it? It operates by the, the body, the feelings, and the spirit is just not in the picture. But we're supposed to be in the reverse. You know, we're the restored man where the spirit controls the body and the emotions. And that's bringing the spirit into the place where the spirit man is in, in charge rather than the, the flesh or the, the emotions. Yes, spot on. I think what I'm finding is that, you know, if you are in the spirit, you can feel so good. It's still a feeling, but it's been led by the spirit. And, and sometimes you kind of you think, oh, yesterday's man is fine. You know, it's not. It's, it's a case of the daily... I, I never purposely don't engage, but there are times where I guess my my hunger um, for the Lord, because of maybe tiredness, is or, or or distraction. I mean, there's been plenty going on here the last few weeks, but I, I, I'm realizing that you can't actually use any of that as an excuse. That's where we have to subjugate our feelings and. I mean, it's only a few weeks since I stopped work, and I guess I was institutionalised. I used to f definitely fit my quiet times and prayer times around a busy schedule. Now I'm trying to work out what a schedule looks like. Which is, which is great, but it's also quite dangerous because you, you can soon get very slack, you know. Um, I think I probably had, you know, I remember I was working and I used to get up and, you know, have a every day I'd regularly have a time before I went to work and now it's kind of I don't have that pressure so sometimes it can be you know you can you can you can feel that you've got all day to do it and then and when you haven't really you know it just slips by time slips by doesn't it well actually no it is the opposite it's that I've got to cut time out to make sure I have a schedule because there is there is so much going on the time doesn't slip oh all right you've still got I a have, lot the, the, um, demand sounds like it's strong, but I mean, there's enough going on. Um, you know, think things that we weren't used to a few weeks ago, etc. Plus the fact because I've stopped work, um, there's a there's a list of jobs that was waiting. I and I now have to I have to work out um, what what is a godly schedule and make sure that in that. I don't say we've got one more thing to do. We've got one more thing to do. Um, it, it's it's very interesting. I I wasn't expecting to, and I don't miss the stress of work at all. But um, certainly there's not been a huge amount of what I would say is free time. Um, and so one needs to choose to make it. You know, if you if you had certain jobs to do or letters to write or forms to fill, you'd make time. Um, I don't want to treat God like that. And I'm, I've just been sort of having conversations with him about how I get some kind of order back in the, in the day. So it, it is quite weird that I, I, yeah, there was a, I mean, I, I still pray every morning, um, Monday to Friday with a, a prayer partner. I'm missing the eight o'clock, I must say. That was really was. Oh yeah. Cause that hasn't really started, has it? That, yeah. that. No, for, for a, a number of very good reasons, I think, for pastors. But, um, yeah, I think that that was really uh, kind of like a, a peg in the ground first thing. So I had prayer time and that uh, each morning. Still got the prayer time. Um, but it, it's actually listening to something that has been like tonight. Um, and I am using Bible in a year as well. But I'm... I just need to get up some momentum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's that, um, you know, the pressure, isn't it? You know, the parable of the seed and the other things come in and it's all different pressures that come on us and we have to guard the seed, don't we? Yeah. 
and some cares of the world are good things yeah you know, um but it, it's just then carving out carving out time um yeah. I, I suppose it's like being a good gardener, you know, God has planted the seed in our life, you know, it says we're born again of imperishable seed, it talks about mm. it, but we have to be good gardeners of that seed, you know, we have to be good mm. stewards to to make sure we water, feed it and and, and attend to the, the seed that he's planted in us, you know, the, the um, and cultivate it. Yeah, lots of feed from foot food for thought thank you richard and uh, from jill too anybody else got any thoughts before we close no let me just put you on so i can see everybody because i can't only see um so you're on gallery now i can see you <laughs> see everybody okay well let's just pray Jill, sorry, Jill. Before we go, I was wondering if somebody, because we haven't heard any Sri Lankan voices, and it would be lovely to hear someone praying in Sri Lankan for Sri Lanka with what's going on now before sure, we go. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Would somebody like to do that who would pray in Sri Lankan for Sri Lanka? You mean Sinhalese, Jill? Sri Lankan's not the language. but I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Sri Lankan. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's nobody's leaping up. No, they will. Somebody will. Come on. Somebody wants Auntie to Jessica do it. will do it. She's always happy to pray. Something ladies pray. You need to unmute yourself there, Auntie. I think you're still on mute. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> you want to, uh, me to uh, pray singly? Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Up to some posted at a Vachanak, a hundred labium again of Hans for a Sutika Napiana Hansa, Eva Goma Swami, of a service from the Sri Lanka, Vinu Yak Nakana, Sri Lanka, a Sam Tanaka Matina, a Palabala, a Aragala Swami, Hansa Hansis, Kamadana, the Patranical Swami, Sri Lanka, Rajit Swami, Yahapat Palatik Swami, Hansa Hansa, then a Manasangi. Divita Vinasa, a Pachka, a Palaking, a Durukala son of Hans to give Balva to Hassan of Barakana, Swami, Yahapat Palak, Swami, Yahapat Cabinet Mandala, Swami of Hans, a last to the number of the Pasta Masam of Hans, a Yaknaka, a Pilla, a Ratta Samadan again in the Kila, Eva Gemma Ukraine, a letter Swami of Hans, Samadan again in his family, Sami, Samadan, Gena Devian Hans, of Hans, a Karuna, a Desho to Bagura. Piano <laughs> Karadar Dukka Vedana was Swamini on the Cham and Atu and Natu Swamini Buho de Natu at Mahaparavala, Vidivala, Manasangi, Givita Vinasa, the Patina Swami of Bohansa, a barakana made Desha, a dick of Bohansa, a Balva to answer a barakana Jason, Obohansi, a ship, the Lekanga, his Hangaval, Arakshakana piano, the Samadan, and then a piano house, on the Yahapa Raj of Palakin within a Swami Hansa. Obohanski Karna to Jiva Tirson or Magapin on a son of his sister, Sami, a dish on water. Obohanski Gallavi within the Kilagan of Sami, Obohanski Gallavi Mount Aylan of Sami, own Gallavin on a Magadipian on a son, Obohansi, Nudana coming on Evagi, Tatawal, the Pateratin of Sami, of Hansa, a barakan of Mirat to Kali Sami, Obohanski Balava to Hansa, a barakan in Yaknak and Majestus, Mr. Swansi in Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. 
All right. Well, God bless you all. Have a good rest of your okay, evening. God bless you, Richard. Thank you. And, um, Thank you. If you get Thank a chance, you. read Romans 6, 7, and 8. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>